all of you here. We really appreciate you coming. This is Swan's first Swan Talks, which is our version of TED Talks. So we're very grateful that you're here tonight and listening to our presentations. Swan has a very important message. We have four pillars that we like to follow. That's to eat well, move well, stay socially connected, and also stay mentally strong. So all of our presentations tonight have that theme within them. Here's a list of our presenters tonight. We have Gordon Smith, Sean Wisner, John Ajusti, that's me, Olivia Foster, Dr. Kyra Meyer, and Dr. Angela Alfaro. And it's really cool um, doing this kind of presentation here in our community because I hope all of you got a personal greeting when you walked through the door. And we're very thankful that you're here. Hi, Matt, I didn't see you come in, so I'm glad you're here too. <laughs> Swan thinks it's very important to acknowledge the land that we are presenting on tonight. So we would like you to take a moment to read this slide. And we want to acknowledge that we live and work, learn and operate on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Chugach Alit Alutik Supiak people. Please take a moment to read this. And our first presentation tonight is Mr. Gordon Smith with the Injury Brainwash. All right. Thanks. Thanks for being here. This is my first show kind of here. So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, hopefully we'll make it worth it. So I am a physical therapist in case uh, you guys are wondering. I've been a physical therapist for 30 years, that sounds better than saying 29, uh, and I had a private practice for 25 years uh, in western Montana and sold that and looked around to find paradise. And so I am here in Valdez and thoroughly enjoying myself. I've been here since last September. I'm not a traveler. I am here permanently and have uh, put stuff down. Yeah. That's, that's a cool thing here, right? <laughs> Not a problem. Um, so, um, as, you, as you heard, mine is the injury brainwash, right? Um, in today's world, our brains, we, we need a little washing, right? Uh, we get to decide how we wash, uh, essentially. This is regarding injuries. Injuries actually wash our brains to some degree. And that's what we're going to go over. And the purpose of this talk is very similar to what I would carry on with my patients, and that is that we have choices. We have choices of what we feed into our brain, and that's what we're gonna explore. We'll explore a little bit of the old model of pain, and then the new model, the new model where we have uh, new information. It comes primarily from neuroscience, brain activity studies, and all these really smart people who have, uh, who have done uh, their research, <laughs> quite literally. My favorite being Mr. Lorimer Mosley. Not only does he have a fantastic Australian accent, um, but he is, he is uh, he's very knowledgeable, he does a lot of studies. And then NOI group is, uh, is a group that is in existence here in the United States. And uh, they also do lectures and training and different things like that with healthcare professionals to learn about recent studies, recent brain studies essentially. So what is a brainwash? Uh, we all have our concept of, of what we feel. You know, oh man, that person is so brainwashed. Am I brainwashed? Do you think I'm just brainwashed in that? Typically, it's like, it's like giving a dog a bath. And if any of you have dogs, which most everybody in Valdez seems to have a dog, the bath time is a little different. They have some connotation that it is bad, right? Oh man, this is just not a good thing. I gotta have a bath again. And uh, that's oftentimes what we associate an injury with. Okay. Uh, it's also unknown. We, we don't even realize what it's doing to us sometimes. Patients will come in and they'll come in with a limp and, oh, I didn't even realize I was doing that. That is part of the injury brainwash that I'm talking about. It is um, information reception, okay? So our body has millions of different receptors. There's all kinds of different receptors. Um, the old model was listen to your pain. I 
unfortunately or unfortunately, I taught this for 20 years. 20 years, it was like, well, you know, watch out if there's pain, you know, there's something going on. And of course, um, your receptors are sending you information. What does that information mean? Um, it's a electrochemical, so not to get too deep into electrophysiology, but um, that's what it does. It sends up signals. Proprioceptors, love proprioceptors. I talk about those all day long in the clinic. Proprioceptors in your ligaments, joints, tendons, muscles, things like that, that, that send information up to your brain. Visual receptors, when you see them, when you see something, uh, that has an influence on your pain as well. Mechanoreceptors, where your joint is in space. No barrel receptors, anybody hit their thumb with a hammer? Those are pressure receptors. Now, we also have the um, occasional you know, uh, change in weather that we might feel pressure in our joints or extra pain and things like that. Those are pressure receptors. We're still studying that to find out how accurate they really are, but nonetheless. So thermal receptors, this is a really big one for our kids. Don't touch that, it's hot, right? Those are our thermal receptors. We learn very quickly what's hot and cold. Interesting pain studies done on red rod automatically feels hot. People, if they're told it's hot, they will immediately feel pain, even though it's cold. So fascinating stuff. So then nociceptors. This is really the one that we really want to get into because way back when, not sure when it was, they named nociceptor. So that's a receptor for pain. And we still refer to this regularly in the medical world. Those are your pain receptors. And what do pain receptors do? Well, typically we would say, there is something wrong. Well, I can break it to you pretty easily. Receptors in your body don't know the difference between right and wrong. There's no moral scale that they learn that this is right or this is wrong. Um, they just simply send information. So nociceptors really don't send pain. They do send information. They don't really send pain. That's a new concept. I had to really get over that when I learned about the new research that was done too. Typically, we would have said injury, there's going to be pain. We see an injury, we feel an injury, there's pain there. Sprain our ankle, ugh, okay? And wherever there's pain, it also equates to injury. Interestingly enough, these are not true. Whoa, that really skipped. That's not true. So injury does not equal pain, and pain does not necessarily mean injury. Now we're gonna explore that just a little bit because there's some wonderful examples that I almost fast forwarded through. So let's take this. This is my, this is my 19 year old uh, mountain biker in Western Montana, very, very popular. And he had built himself just this, this really fantastic gap jump for those of you who are mountain bikers. This was a 35 plus feet gap jump that he would launch off and go and, and hit this thing. Well, he noticed midair, he wasn't gonna make it, so he did what he had done many, many times before in trying to build this wonderful gap jump. And he bailed off of his bike and he landed and rolled and stood up, right? Well, he stood up and then he fell down. And he stood up again, he fell down. And he went, what, what's going on? And he looks down and on one side, he sees the bottom of his foot facing him. And on the other side, he's standing and his other foot is flopping out there. And he fractured his tibia and fibula, the distal part of it, the, the bottom part of your leg down there. So he had not only a dislocation, complete dislocation of his ankle, he also had a fracture on the other side. So double duty. And interestingly enough, when I'm taking his history and all that in, in physical therapy, uh, he said, you know, I really didn't have much pain to begin with. You didn't have much pain, how is that even possible? So in his mind, there was a construct, okay, that, that didn't send a signal. He'd done that so many times and he had broken a lot of bones before too, so. Uh, but what he did get, he got diaphoretic, uh, meaning he started sweating, okay? He got nauseous, okay? And, uh, and eventually, his, of course, his friends, you know, carried him out and he went to the hospital. He said the first pain was when the doctor put a cast on it, then it really started hurting. I don't know if that was the signal going up there, the information that said, uh-oh, something's not right. So this is another example. Um, I, I love these, I love x-rays. Uh, so this is called osteoarthritis, right? This is an elderly woman, uh, had a previous uh, ACL reconstruction, that's what the screws are in there for. 
this, this, oh man. Orthopedic surgeons, they love to see that because the number one thing that orthopedic surgeons love to say is, that's bone on bone. Ooh. Okay, bone on bone. Well, we're, we're not gonna do anything about that. That's bone on bone, right? Hear that all the time. And it's also, oh man, uh, yeah, mm, terrible. This person didn't have any pain except when hiking downhill. That was the hardest part. And she would get pretty severe pain hiking downhill. Could mountain bike, could hike uphill all day long. Uh, it was the downhill that got her. So why doesn't this osteoarthritis create pain all the time if bone on bone creates that pain? Okay, so we're gonna explore that. So then, look at that, all better, right? Look at that gorgeous, gorgeous joint space. This is what PTs love to look at. You know, look at all that space now there. And, uh, and the surface is so pristine, right? right? The orthopedic surgeon did a great job. It's all better. More pain now. Ooh, boy, okay, why is that? Well, certainly the tissues have to accommodate. You know, these were previously pretty shortened there, and they didn't really do anything with those, so they've got to stretch out. So it's a lengthy rehabilitation process, not only to her knee, but to the injury brain as well. So uh, for any of you who have mountain biked, this is Moab, okay? This is a wonderful thing. Uh, and this is like a little, little drop. And this is that same elderly woman, <laughs> which my wife's gonna love that, right? And of course, here we go. <clears throat> there it is, right? Oh, boy, that skipped. Okay, let's try that again. Well, I got, maybe I should point it up there. Okay, one more time. That video, there it is, right? It's beautiful. So this looks actually much better when you slow it down. Because then, if you watch, right at one point here, she, her head's gonna come up and she says something like, Gordon, you jerk, or something, I can't remember exactly. And down we go. What are we feeling? Are we all kind of going, oh man, that looks like it may be freaking hurt. Did she break her wrist? No. She was okay, she did fine. We lived to mountain bike another day. Okay, this is your mirror neuron. So if any of you felt a level of discomfort with that video that I repeated over and over and over, um, it's because you have these neurons in your brain, right? These neurons that mirror what you see. This is how athletes become better by watching film. This is how you can actually figure out how to do something better by watching it demonstrated. You have mirror neurons in your brain that help you out with those things. So this leads us into phantom limb pain. Remember, pain equals injury, injury equals pain. When there's no limb, there's no injury really in your foot if your leg is cut off here, but you still feel pain in your foot. So the new research, the new model, starts to explain some of these neurons and how we can actually not only treat phantom limb pain, but we can actually cure it. Fantastic stuff, great breakthroughs. Okay, and that brings us to the new model of pain, which is the pain brain. What is the pain brain? Pain brain is essentially an area up in your, in your brain, in your brain, just like your neuromotor cortex or anything else. It's an area where all of this information gets, gets processed. All of those receptors go up there. We also call it the protective brain because we don't always like to say, oh, it's a pain brain. It, it's protective, it's there to protect you. It has been developed so that you don't, hopefully, it sometimes, don't do things that are too incredibly silly, right? So think of it as a scale. And in that scale, there's all of these receptors, remember? And they're sending information, and somewhere in there, that protective brain decides if it's going on one side or the other. That's what we call a dim versus a sim. What does that mean? Danger in me, okay? That's danger, that's dangerous. So these receptors send the information up to that pain brain and they decide whether or not it's dangerous or if it's safe. Safety in me, a dim versus a sim. So if you think about any of your injuries, um, usually there's this process that goes on associated with that. So pain, we realize then, is an output from our brain not an input. Doesn't no nothing is sending up these nociceptors that we previously thought of. No, it comes from your brain out to the area that it's getting information from, and it'll send that signal out, signal of pain, 
in order to protect you. So if we've ever seen a helicopter mom is the term, so where they're guarding and protecting, and that's kind of what your pain brain does, your protective brain, it does that. It keeps you from hurting yourself, right? And it's very effective, very, very effective. In fact, it will keep us from doing a lot of stuff. Sometimes will almost paralyze us. Um, and just like in typical brainwash fashion, it is repeated over and over and over again. And that is, of course, the injury brainwash. That is the brainwash part because all these receptors are sending this information and it gets weighted down. And that there's different things that influence that scale. That's the interesting part. And that's the part where all of this, I have to interpret all of those smart people that did all of this research, Lorimer Mosley, David Butler, Adrian Lowe, um, they're, they're good. So this is a question I get people ask me all the time. So my pain's just in my brain? Does that mean it's just in my head? That's what we used to say. Oh yeah, his pain is all in his head. Well, guess what? Everybody's pain is in their head. There's nobody, nobody left out. It's all the same. Here it is, here it is. This is Gordon's interpretation of what all those really smart people said and studied and everything else. So I have uh, divided things into three groups. First, knowledge. First thing that influences that scale, knowledge. Is that just the cutest kid ever? That is my son, 23 years ago. <laughs> so if we've ever seen, I use this picture because if we've ever seen a little kid going down the street for the first time, walking for the first time, they fall down, what's the first thing they do? Look for a parent, where's that knowledge gonna come from? Are you okay, are you okay, okay? And sure enough, PT school was like this as well. We had so many injuries and so many diseases in PT school, mostly because this, this process was weighted down on the danger side of that scale, and so pain was sent out in our fledgling PTs brains. Dr. Google, this is a great source of information, right? Yeah. It is actually. I mean, it's a great source of information. But um, that knowledge can influence the, uh, the pain brain. So then we talked about your surgeon when he said, oh, it's bone on bone. That's probably as bad as I've ever seen. Ooh, man, that back. You're just, oh, man. Gordon, you're not going to rehab yourself out of that rotator cuff tear. That, I mean, look at it. It's terrible, right? And of course, there's always the one that I really like is, well, my friend had this and, uh, and he did pretty well, but then his mom's sister's cousin, um, she didn't do very well. So what's the difference? I don't know, 30 years, I still haven't figured that one out. Okay, so is it danger? Is it safety? That's your information system. Um, touch, touch is the second one, okay? Knowledge was the first, touch. Touch gives us information. So whether you get it from massage, chiropractic, acupuncture, icy hot, uh, your heating pad, and of course I love the coaches, you know, this is the old thing, hey, I'll rub some dirt on it and get back out there, right? That's what my football coach used to say, rub some dirt on it. Well, he wasn't entirely false, because rubbing it would give you the information that you need to process that pain. Is it danger, is it safety, right? So last one, this is great. Love this, I would be in pain if I got that high in the air. And uh, I would not be able to do that uh, at all. Um, so that in and of itself doesn't give pain, of course. But the last thing that influences, also influences all of these, that will create pain or take away pain is of course movement. Movement is absolutely essential, uh, which we'll go into as well. So, I can't exercise, I hurt too much. We've, uh, we've been through that, right? We have to move, whatever level we can, we have to move. Remember the scepters, okay? Here's what I say, up to, not through pain. And those are your three keys to making it through. Um, aerobic exercise calms nerves, yes, definitely. So what, so what does it take? It takes an opportunity, every injury is an opportunity. That's what I say to all my patients, too. This, op this is an opportunity to make some changes, right? Do something different. Sometimes we have to change our behaviors. Maybe not launch off of that 35-foot gap, or maybe do something different there. 
Uh, we stop doing other things. Uh, maybe we need to eat right. Love that one. And then we start doing others. And when we finish rehab, this is usually what we feel like. <sighs> right? Excellent. Whatever you consistently do or don't do, your body's going to respond to. I appreciate it. This is uh, my one plug for Beyond PT. You'll be able to find at least my talk, uh, maybe the whole thing, the link on there uh, on YouTube. Thank you. I'm Michael Faro, and I'm the board chair for Swan. And we're gonna have a little bit of technical uh, mix up in a minute, and so we'll just talk about Swan. So thankfully, I think all of you know about Swan. You've all come to our events before. And so we're a nonprofit organization that really cares about the community and tries to incorporate a lot of different activities, whether they're social connection, eating better, moving more, or um, mental strongness. And so it's really great to have people come out because things like this, you know, COVID was a really hard time. And so now we're all back together again and we can share in each other's company and we can learn from each other. And it's just an amazing event. So I want to thank Bianca for all of her hard work and. Uh, Sean Wisner, who is not part of Swan, but has stepped up to the plate because he really was passionate about this type of thing. So, um, yes, again, thank you so much. So, events that we have done in the past, we've had the Swan Symposium, and that was last fall, and it'll be coming back this fall. Uh, um, Olivia has been amazing so far in trying to get some things set up with the blood bank and mammogram and getting the room reserved, so it should be a big shindig of an event, and we hope to see you all there. Um, coming up next week is the um, walk, the Blue Walk, uh, Child Abuse Prevention Walk. And that's at uh, 5 o'clock at the hospital, right? 5 o'clock at the hospital, uh, so we can shed awareness on child abuse. We have a bike rodeo that's coming in May, and uh, lots of fun activities, so stay tuned. We'd be uh, super excited to have you all at our events. So I believe we are ready to move on, and our next presenter is uh, Sean Wisner. And he's going to talk to us about leading humans. And he just got an amazing pen that says he's a good human. So I would trust what he has to say. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, I like teaching leadership and talking about leadership. It's a passion project of mine uh, that started with getting my master's degree and studying all sorts of different forms of leadership. And mostly what I figured out what was what didn't work. And, um, and what didn't work was just focusing on the hard skills all the time of whatever group of people you're leading. And so we started digging into the soft skills and that's why um, soft skills are human skills and human skills are what make good leaders and I firmly believe that. Uh, I am a parent, I'm a fire chief I have a master's degree and I have a business where I teach classes about leadership and I have a lot of fun with all of those. <clears throat> um, I talk about leading humans because working in emergency service organizations, um, we typically focus on tactical leadership, right? Every 99% of the training that we do is on, you know, how to do the thing. Uh, take put fires out or operate emergency medical situations, uh, police incidents, whatever it might be, but we don't ever talk about the people. And it turns out we have these people that do these amazing things, right? This is a paramedic that crashed the helicopter. That's jet fuel pouring out of the helicopter. And that paramedic is pulling the baby out of the crashed helicopter and walked that baby to the hospital on his own because, because he's full of compassion and that's why he does this job, he wants to help people, right? We have wildland firefighters that are putting out entire cities across the United States. Nine months a year, um, watching all sorts of destruction and, and then getting left alone with no health insurance benefits and no um, behavioral health support and what do they do for the winter? They go and they drink, usually, or they battle their depression, right? Um, until the season starts back up and then we do it all over again. See, I grew up in a, in a fire service where we were told, 
suck it up, buttercup. You're either cut out for this job or you're not. And it turns out that after about 30 years of it, that doesn't work. <laughs> and we have police officers and all the things that they face, right? Literally having guns pointed at them and having an entire society turn against them. And we just say, you're either cut out for this job or you're not, right? Well, when you work in these kind of fields and you see trauma every day and you experience trauma every day, um, this thing happens in your brain. You end up in this fight or flight mode that is really hard to turn off. Your amygdala shifts open and it, and it um, it hijacks your whole brain, and it makes it really hard to go home and face situations uh, in argument with your spouse or with your children, right? <laughs> and uh, it makes it really hard because you live in this fight or flight mode. It's a, it's a prehistoric part of your brain. The saber-toothed tiger is always trying to chase you, right? And you don't know how to turn it off because we are, have to be ready. Even when I'm not actually working on a call, I'm waiting for my pager to go off, right? And, and there's a whole society of us that are, that are facing this every single day. We, um, and it makes it really challenging to deal with everyday situations. And yet, all we do is train these people how to do the thing, right? How to be a good EMT or how to be a good firefighter, how to be a good police officer. We don't train people how actually deal with this. We say, you're either cut out for this job or you're not. Suck it up, buttercup, right? <laughs> Turns out that doesn't work because uh, emergency service organization people, the suicide rate is 17 times the national average. We're facing, facing post-traumatic stress, injuries, um, substance abuse, Divorce rates are off the charts, depression and anxiety. <clears throat> Firefighters and police officers die by suicide more often than in the line of duty. That hits home for me as a leader. And so I wanted to do something about it. So now I go around uh, and I talk to the different fire departments and I talk to different people about leadership. There are lots of reactive resources out there. There's Behavioral Health Alliance, there's After Action Reviews. Uh, Gianna does uh, critical incident stress management for the local fire department here in town. But those are reactive approaches, right? That's who gets left behind. And we wanna do something about it. <clears throat> I think we could take a proactive approach. And that means changing the culture of the organization that we work in. And that means we, as leaders, need to change what we're doing. Turns out that these soft skills are actually what matters. Yet 99% of what we do in these lines of work is teach hard skills. It turns out that if we try to take a little bit different approach to the way we deal with people, remember this slide? These people, these are our people. We need to take care of them, right? because we don't want that to happen anymore. I had a, a firefighter that worked for me who took his own life uh, the day after he went off ship. So how can we change it? Suck it up, buttercup is not the answer. Turns out 80% of firefighters 
and police officers have experienced bullying in the workforce. 75% of women in the emergency service organizations have experienced sexual harassment. Um, how is that helping the problem, right? So we as leaders, leadership is, and the culture of every organization is triggered at the top and measured at the bottom. And if we're measuring bullying and sexual harassment in the workforce, we as leaders are the problem. And so we need to take a different approach. I like to talk about four different pillars of leadership. Emotional intelligence, empathy, mindset, and connection. And I get a lot of funny looks when I give these talks at police stations and fire departments around the country, but um, what is emotional intelligence? What is trust? What is transparency? We are asking these people to do things like save babies when the helicopter they're riding in crashes, right? We need to have trust in our organizations. Emotional intelligence, by definition, is being in control of your emotions. Um, but I think it's really how you react to your emotions is, is the essence of emotional intelligence. <clears throat> I'm a very sensitive person. I've been told that my whole life. I have lots of feelings. Um, I can't control my feelings. I can't control my emotions. But I can control how I react to my emotions, right? So think about that. We um, can learn different techniques to take, take pauses, take breaths, and not instantly react uh, when we get triggered. Because again, it's not on fire. The saber-toothed tiger is not chasing us. But sometimes we're in the office, and because we live in that world all the time, we can be in the office setting and we get triggered, and it's the same exact feeling, fight or flight, and we're running from it, and so we need to Think about our reaction to those emotions and, and how to better do that. And it's um, it's amazing how well it works if you can put it to practice. A good um, emotional literacy is a huge component of that, and I think Ms. Jushi's gonna talk about that in a little bit, but uh, emotional literacy, name it to tame it is what we say. And when you start to feel an emotion, like anger or sadness, right? You can dig in a little deeper and find out that it's really not anger, like, oh, I got my feelings hurt, or oh, I'm frustrated, or oh, I'm scared, and just taking a minute to think about the deeper feeling behind the initial reaction that you're having, and dig into it a little bit will really help you uh, in the long run. Okay. Better leader. Empathy, another pillar of leadership. Empathy is uh, really putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, really listening to understand and not just listening for your turn to speak, um, which I think a lot of people do. They just are just waiting to talk instead of actually listening and attempting to understand. It's very powerful if you can put it into practice. Active listening, insight. Mindset has changed my life for the better in every aspect. Um, a scarcity mindset, which many leaders, unfortunately, uh, use, is that um, in order for me to win, you have to lose. In order for me to get something, somebody else has to lose something, right? That's a scarcity mindset. But it turns out that the universe is abundant and there's enough for all of us. And everyone can win. And we can all get better in the process. My favorite quote is, uh, you can't compete with me because I want you to win too. Right? We wrote that on the board at the pool. And uh, it, really, it really makes a difference. And if you, if you can pull that together and lead with love and lead in such a way that you want your people to get better, um, people feel heard, people feel seen, people feel safe, and people feel like they can talk about stuff, which is really what we're doing here is trying to solve this behavioral health crisis that we have in the emergency service organizations, right? Um, mindset, fixed mindset, growth mindset, 
and a benefit mindset. We talked about um, scarcity and abundance, and we'll talk about uh, benefit mindset next. Just change the way you're thinking. It takes a little bit of self-work, it takes a little bit of effort, it takes a little bit of self-reflection. You kind of have to take yourself down off of that pedestal that a lot of leaders find themselves on, but it's profound how well it works. And then connection and collaboration. Um, it turns out, I don't know everything. <laughs> it turns out, as leaders, we need to foster connection in our, um, in our workforces and in our teams, and we can collaborate, and everybody gets better in the process. Because ultimately what we want, if people feel safe and people feel seen and heard, they can become better too. And isn't that the essence of leadership, is making the people that you lead better? Makes us all win. You can't compete with me, because I want you to win too. And, and hey, it's not just me. This is the MIT Sloan Management Review saying, toxic culture is the strongest predictor of industry-adjusted industry attrition, 10 times more important than compensation in predicting turnover. Uh, don't, as leaders, we also need to keep people we need people to stay working for us. And it just turns out, we just need to be a little bit nicer. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate being here. Again, thank you so much for being here this, this evening. I'm gonna talk about something today that I am very passionate about, and that's mindset. Mindset matters. I'm going to disclose a little information about myself right now. It might be a little hard, but it really proves a point because I've worked really hard over the past few years to make sure my mindset matters. So, why, why is this so important to me? When I was younger, I was my own worst enemy. My dad's in the audience right now, he's shaking his head, I see him. <laughs> I was so hard on myself. And I was hard on myself because I constantly listened to what other people were saying to me. I didn't listen to my own inner voice. I listened to other people's voices, and that's what I heard. I was told, you're too emotional. You're too dramatic. You're too loud which everyone in here kind of knows that I am, but <laughs> I was told by a teacher in elementary school, you're not good at math. So guess what I believed my whole life? You're too loud, you're too dramatic, you're not good at math. Pappy's here, sitting in here, and he's like, yep, I get this. It was my biggest challenge my whole life. It was hard because that's what I heard in my brain. I didn't hear my inner voice. I heard the voices of other people telling me I can't. That's a fixed mindset. I flunked out of my first year of college because no one told me an eight o'clock remedial math class was not my best friend. I had to figure it out. When I took my praxis test to become a teacher with my master's of elementary teaching, I flunked that test three times. I had a tutor, I cried to my dad, I passed it the fourth time by one point, a week before my graduation. It was hard, but I didn't give up. I didn't give up because I had adults in my life who told me that I could do it. I had adults in my life who believed in me and knew that I had it in me to succeed. I wasn't too loud, I wasn't too dramatic, 
and I'm actually all right at math now. That's actually my favorite thing to teach, isn't that funny? But no higher than fifth grade. <laughs> so that's a little bit about me. I had to find within myself how to listen to my inner voice and drown out the other voices that were not doing me any favors. That's why mindset's so important to me. Can you imagine how different our lives might be if we focused on our potential and not our failures? Here's another kind of quick little story. One time I gave a presentation. It was a presentation to a room of 50 people. I had 49 positive evaluations. I had one that gave me a negative evaluation. What's the evaluation that I focused on? I focused on the one. I focused on the one evaluation out of 50 people, 49, took away something from my presentation. I focused on the failure rather than the potential. 49 people took away information. One didn't. What should I have focused on? I should have focused on all 50, actually, because they were in the room with me. Focus on our potential and not our failures. That's part of fixed mindset. Research shows that mindsets play a significant role in determining our thoughts, our attitudes, and our beliefs. And I 100% agree with that research. According to Stanford psychologist Carol Dweck, your beliefs play a pivotal role and they want you to, it's what you achieve. Dweck has found that it is your mindset that plays a significant role in determining achievement and success. And isn't it that, that's the truth. We talk more to ourselves than anyone else throughout the day. You should have heard me this morning in the Fat Tire Bike Bash talking to myself, trying to get through that horrendous wind. <laughs> Jeremy was up there helping me with that. <laughs> How we talk to ourselves matters. The words we say to ourselves matter. I teach children from preschool to fifth grade. In my span as an educator, I've taught kids as early as one year old, I taught adults as late as 76 years old. And the one thing I can tell you that made a difference in their success, in their goals, was their mindset. And it's not just what they're hearing themselves, it's what others are saying to them. So even though I teach children, I really want all the adults in this room to pay attention to your own mindset because we are the examples that our kids see. We are their role models and they listen to us. If I'm at home and I'm negative, what do you think my son's gonna pick up on? He's gonna pick up on a negative mindset. It's important for us to listen to what we're saying. It's important for us to do our inner work to have that growth mindset because we have a lot of people watching us, don't we? We have a lot of little people who are looking up to us to see how we should think. So again, why does mindset matter? It's a powerful belief system that we have to take seriously. Your perception of yourself and the world around you is a framework for your work and for your life. Mindset is vital for your success. This is because what you think about directly affects your behavior. Mindset is the single most significant factor impacting a person's success, whether personal or professional. And as you enter each moment, your brain triggers a mindset all day long. All day long, your brain is shooting waves of mindset. And that offers thought, belief, feeling, and attitude. Mindset influences how you will engage in the moment presented in other and presented. And in other words, your behavior is directly influenced by the mindset you keep. Here's some examples now. And I, this is what I was talking about, fixed mindset versus growth mindset. And this is really the work of Carol Dweck. Um, she has a fabulous book as well. She's just a great TED talk too. Don't tell her I did a small talk about her. <laughs> so <laughs> her book, it really focuses on fixed mindset versus growth mindset. Here's some examples of things that we say to ourselves in these different types of mindsets. So if you see a fixed mindset, that's your failure in your abilities. That's when you're thinking, I'm not good at this. That's when you say the word can't. Can't in my dictionary is a bad word. You don't say can't because then you're stuck on that. If you have a growth mindset, it's I cannot do this yet. I'm not there yet, but with practice, I'm going to get it. 
It's realizing that maybe something is challenging for you, but you don't give up. And one of the biggest, like this has been a quote in my mind for the last year, it's comparison is the thief of joy. When we compare ourselves to other people, we're not allowing ourselves to succeed. Comparison is the thief of joy. That's a fixed mindset when you compare yourself to other people. Growth mindset is when you know you have the ability to succeed. If you are talking to yourself in a kind, respectful manner. I can learn to do anything I want. Challenges help me grow. Feedback is constructive. I like to try new things. There's been re new research now that is taking growth mindset step up to another level. So it's fixed mindset, which is the negative feelings, thoughts, beliefs, attitudes you have in your own brain. There's growth mindset, where it's more individual. You're really trying to improve your own mind. You're trying to focus on how your effort is going, and you're growing through a process of change within. So the new mindset that research is really focusing now is called benefit mindset. Benefit mindset is when you're focusing on the mindset and the success and well-being of your community. So there's fixed, there's growth, and there's benefit. Benefit focuses on who we are being and why we do what we do, and being of a benefit to being a transformation. So when we have a benefit mindset, we're really trying to, to help our community and the well-being of others. And that's one step about, uh, above growth mindset now. So, is it clicking? Oh, whoa, hello. <laughs> it's not intermission. I'm scared I'm gonna press something weird. Okay, I'll go to this slide now. <laughs> so, one of the hardest things right now coming out of a pandemic, a pandemic is the mindset that we have. Three years, we could not control what happened to us, right? We could control it, we lost control. And that really affected our mindset, how we lived our lives. We tend to worry about what other people think about us, what other people do. We can't control what other people think of us. We can't control what happens around me. Believe me, I live in Valdez, I wanna control the weather. Are you kidding me? Today was rough. <laughs> you can't control the past, you can't control the future, but you can control how you speak to yourself. You can control the goals you have for yourself. You can control what energy you give to, how you handle challenges. You can handle your boundaries. One of the most frustrating things that I deal with probably daily is when a child I'm working with comes up to me and they say, Miss Juicy, I'm dumb. I don't get this, this is stupid. I can't do this. You know what I do to them? I look at them straight in the face and I say, don't talk to my friend like that. Huh? Yeah, you, don't talk to my friend like that. And then they're like, oh, I am talking to myself in a negative way. Absolutely you are. You are your own worst enemy, right? We have to really learn how to start talking to ourselves in a positive way. We control what we say to ourselves. We need to get rid of all that hubbub, all that noise going around from outside and focus on our own inner voice. What you say to yourself, it matters. So how do you do this? Oh boy, here's some tips. It's taken me a long time. Decades? Yes, correct, the decades. <laughs> it has. And I'm not a master at it yet. Every day is hard because I still have those inner critics talking to me in my brain. But I'll tell you what, I've taken steps to really help my mindset. And this is what I wanna share with you today. You can work on your mindset yourself by just asking yourself a few questions. You don't need to ask all these questions every single day. You can take a couple, remember them, and start practicing. Some of the questions you can ask yourself to help work on your mindset set are, what did you learn today? What steps did you take to make today successful? What are some different strategies you could have used? How did you keep going when things got tough? This is reflection. 
Reflection is inner work that we need to do every day if we want to grow. We need to support those around us also because they're listening to us and we're listening to them. We need to really develop our people so we're all on the same page to support each other. Feedback to encourage others. This will be challenging, but I believe you can master it. Our friends and family need to hear this. We might think they know that, but they don't. You haven't got it yet, but you will if you keep working and thinking about it. I really appreciate your effort. How important is it to hear the word appreciation? It's okay to take risks. That's how we learn. Pay no attention to the typo. Getting better takes time, and I see you are improving. Growth mindset, I'll edit it later, right? <laughs> <laughs> These are some habits that I've incorporated into my life that have really made a difference. You don't need to do all this tomorrow. This has taken me years to think about, years to really get a handle on. And some days I don't do anything because I'm tired, but I still make sure to talk to myself kindly. Everyday habits to improve your mindset. Having social connection. That's something that we really talk about with SWAMP. It's so important to have your people. I'm not talking about going out and partying every night. I'm talking about have someone that you can check in with, send a text to, maybe make a phone call to, send a chat message to, check in on your people, have that social connection. Taking a pause. It's so hard to always be doing when we need to be being. It's okay to rest. We need to listen to our bodies. In a world where everything is so fast paced, we need to be okay with stopping for a moment and really doing a body scan and feeling how we're feeling. Maybe we do need a break, and that's okay. It's okay to take a break. Staying active, Gordon talked about movement. Movement is very important. Breathing exercises, laughing, setting boundaries, which is something we have control in, right? Other people don't have control of that. We have control of that for ourselves. Practicing gratitude, having a gratitude journal has made a huge difference in my life because I'm taking the time to appreciate the things that are going well. Stay in the present. If we're stuck in the past or worrying too much about the future, it's really hard to be focused on what's happening right now. Drinking water, eating regularly, good sleep routine, spend time in nature. How healing is nature? One of the things I do every single day is I need to go out in nature. This summer, I completed a race, and an elder, Rosita Whirl, spoke to us, and she said, when things get hard, follow the ans our ancestors on our sacred land. She's a Clinket elder, did you know? And things got really hard, <laughs> really hard. <laughs> and all of a sudden, there was an eagle flying overhead and a raven on the side of me. And at that moment, I knew I could do it. And at that moment, my whole life changed. I really felt the power of nature around me. And ever since then, every day, even if it's just a walk outside, it helps ground you. It helps stay in the present. And it's so important to get out to nature because I think we're having so many things thrown at us from media, TV, just everywhere that we forget really where we're coming from. Start your day with intentions. Start your day and end your night with reflection. One of my best friends sends intentions every single morning, and I do the same, and it holds me accountable for the day. It gives me a checklist of these are things I want to accomplish. Every night I reflect. Sometimes if it was a really hard day, I think about what are three things I'm proud of so I don't go to sleep with that negative mindset. Remember, growth is not linear. I still have really hard days, but they're few and far between. I encourage everyone to work on your mindset. Take these tips I've given you today, and remember, you are enough. You don't need to listen to those outer critics. You need to listen to your inner critic, and you need to be kind to yourself and what you say. This is my swan talk, thank you. <laughs> Welcome back. I hope everyone got some refreshments, had a chance to kind of think about what you just learned in the first half there, had a little time to socially connect. 
Now it's a great pleasure to introduce my friend, Miss Olivia Foster. Hello, Belkies. How's everybody doing tonight? Thank you so much for coming out. It's my pleasure to present for Swan, and I'm going to highlight uh, Move More Pillar for Swan. Moving has always brought me tremendous joy throughout my life, and I want to encourage all of you to move more in life. Specifically tonight, I'm going to go over active transportation. As some of you may know, you may see me walking frequently through town. I usually wear a black jacket. It's pretty long. I have rain boots. I have spiry boots. I've got all the boots, and I've got all the accoutrements to keep myself nice and dry most days. Some days I can't find gear that keeps me dry. So specifically, I'm going to talk about active transportation. I'm going to talk about what that means exactly, different types of active transportation, why it's important to actively transport, and things that are happening in our community that you can participate in and engage more with active transportation. So, I fondly remember my very first mode of active transportation. You have to go back with me to 1985. It was the Cactus Rose. It had a banana seat filled for two. Probably shouldn't have two people on this, on this Cactus Rose because I wasn't the best driver. It had eight handlebars on it and some nice shimmery tassels that hung down and blew through the wind as I glided through the air. It also had some really handy fenders on it for when I would accidentally run over dog turds and puddles of kitty cat urine in the alleyways. Um, but even the fender sometimes didn't save me because that turd would get stuck on the top part of the fender and then I'd spend a lot of the ride like, what is that smell? And I'd be looking around but you know, with time you learn that it's pretty important to wash your bike down after you get done using it. That piece of chrome and steel gave me the first real taste of adventure, independence, and freedom. I used to ride down the alleyway and I'd see this older gentleman who lived down the way and he would call me Cactus Rose and I would promptly screech my brakes on and my back wheel would squirrel around a little bit and I'd say, dude, my name is not Cactus Rose. <laughs> How many times do I have to tell you this? But he, he and I built an endearing relationship over time and we got to know each other and we just kind of liked to poke fun at each other and it was a good, good idea to talk to him because he had a lot of good insight on life so active transport is any self-powered or human propelled mode of transportation. The different types of active transport are walking, biking, roller skating, skateboarding. Matt, you should be up here roller skating. We could do the fun, woo, Titanic thing. Um, skateboarding, the old rip sticks, I know you know what those are, they're those skateboards that people wiggle down the road using, and I'm always like, there's got to be a more effective way to actively transport, but either way, they're out there being physically active, getting their groove on, getting their heart rate up, and that's what's important. In life, we find that Sure, it'd be nice to have the one-piece spandex suit, but that's not what the most important thing is. The most important thing is to prioritize your time and make time to get outside and be physically active. So I talk about physical activity because physical activity increases our muscle mass, and our muscle mass is actually what increases our resiliency as human beings. Not only can muscle mass help us recover from a trauma, it can, which is probably gonna happen any second. <laughs> Hopefully, I lived at some weeks before I came in. Um, but it can also help prevent chronic disease conditions like obesity, um, depression, and cancer. So 
Muscle mass, like I said, is resiliency. The U.S. Department for Health and Human Services have recommendations for adults and for children. So the recommendations change based on your age. But let's take a child who's three to five years old. They recommend, that's you Althea, that you get about three to five hours every single day of physical activity. If you're six to 17 years old, they recommend that you get one hour of moderate to vigorous physical activity every single day. And if you're older than 17, which I think is the majority of us in this room, they recommend that you get anywhere from 150 minutes to 300 minutes of physical activity every single week. So when you do the math on that, it doesn't seem like that much. But a lot of people don't have a ton of time. So if you do the math, it's about 30 to 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity every day. And you might be asking yourself, what is moderate? What is vigorous? Well, to figure that out, you first have to find what your maximum heart rate is. And we do that by taking 220 minus our current age. So let's just take my age. <laughs> 220 minus 20, just to make it a round number. And that gives us a number of 200. From that maximum heart rate of 200, to find that moderate level of exertion, you're gonna multiply that by 0.65 to 0.75. And if you are looking for that vigorous level of physical activity, you're gonna multiply that by 73 to 97. And that kind of gives you where your heart rate should be when you're exercising. When you're as old as I am at this ripe age of 20 and as experienced with physical activity, you kind of get to understand and know what that moderate versus vigorous physical activity feels like. So I just recommend active transportation. And here's why. Because if you can make time to walk to work, if you can make time to walk to the store, if you can make time to walk to the post office, it's gonna increase your activity. And your physical activity, again, is what creates that muscle mass. And that muscle mass is a, what creates resilience for us as human beings. Physical activity is super duper important. So take advantage of the time that you have and prioritize it. So like we talked about, when you're physically active, you don't need the one-piece spandex. You don't need the yoga pants. You just gotta get out and do it. Look at me. I'm in a, in a really nice dress that I just bought. This is the first time I've worn it. I bought it special for this presentation. And you don't have to do this. You could just wear jeans. You just, the point of physical activity is to get out and do it. And research shows that if you spend at least 10 consecutive minutes on physical activity, that's where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck. So you take that 150 to 300 minutes of exercise or physical activity, and you span it out over the course of a week, you get those 10 minute increments, and it adds up over time. I mean, it takes me about 10 minutes to walk a mile. So take advantage of living in a small community if you live out the road, park your car, grab a bike. Research shows that people who bike have even bigger impacts health-wise from biking to work. And I think that that's probably because when you bike, you're using a little bit more strength all over your body and it's definitely a more vigorous workout. So in conclusion, we've learned that Active transportation can increase your physical activity levels. Your physical activity levels can increase your muscle mass and therefore resiliency. Active transportation, it can increase your social capital. Just like that elderly gentleman that I met when I was a young kid, every day when I go down the street, I see the same people, I wave at them, I build relationships with my community and that creates capital. And it's easy. 
It doesn't take a, a running suit. It doesn't take a buddy, but it's nice to have a buddy. So get out and try it. It's worth it. Round of applause for Olivia. What a great presentation. I gotta say though, Dr. Alfaro and I were a little worried when you got a little close to the stage here. <laughs> but we got a lot of doctors in the house right now. We're okay, right? Okay. <laughs> so next up is another friend of mine, Dr. Meyer, and she has some really good information for us about the teen and tween brain. I do have a quicker. I'm all set. I'm like Jonna, so I'm going to bring this over here because I have my, my super slick notes. Um, so my name is Dr. Kyra Meyer, and I'm here tonight to talk with you guys about the teen and the tween brain. Okay, so raise your hand if you've ever been a teenager. Yeah, right? Um, I want you to think back. Was there ever a time that you thought, I am feeling all the feelings and I have no idea why? Perhaps? Yes. Thank you, kind citizen. We've all been there. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about what's happening inside of brains and how you as a either engaged community member or a parent yourself can help your teen or your tween go through this time. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is what's called um, synaptic pruning and neural growth. So synaptic pruning and neural growth kind of go together like peas and carrots, right? You can't have one without the other. And pruning is just like what you do in your garden, right? And you're like, oh, I don't like how this looks, I'm gonna take this out. When we start going through, especially young adolescents, there are a bunch of things that our brains do that we just don't need anymore. Um, I want you to think back to when your kiddos were little and they wanted a glass of water. They would do that thing where they would like launch their little bodies onto the counter and then like twist around and open the thing and right? All those things, you don't need that anymore because you're tall enough. So we're gonna prune those things away. Um, unfortunately, um, well, not unfortunately, because I think as parents, we look back at those things with very much wonder and amazement that our children's brains were capable of figuring out how to get into the cupboards to begin with. But those synapses, that brain space needs to be freed up because there's so much happening. Um, we're freeing up that space to learn how to do other things like learning how to drive, learning how to cook mac and cheese on the stove without burning the house down, that's really important, um, and how to do algebra too. And this process goes uh, back to front. So I want you to hold up your hand like you're about to high five someone. I want you to tuck your thumb in and close your hand. This is a really accurate representation of your brain. Up front, you have your prefrontal cortex, that's right here. And on the inside, you have your amygdala, okay? So your prefrontal cortex right here, I like to say that every time you do something that's silly or maybe makes you think, oh, I really shouldn't have done that, you're reminded of your prefrontal cortex because you go like this. Ugh. Prefrontal cortex, it's in charge of your decision making, right? It's in charge of your upper level decision making. This means things like, where should I go to college? Should I try to cut around this car while I'm driving? Should I, I don't know, do any of the things, any of the millions of choices that teens and tweens are responsible for making. Um, and when we talk about synaptic pruning and growth, this process, like I said, goes back to front. So we start in the back of the brain, which is the amygdala. Sean Wisner talked a little bit earlier about what the amygdala is responsible for, but I want you to bear in mind that your amygdala has three main functions, emotion, Teens, right? Lots of feelings, lots of the feelers. Survival instinct, sometimes as parents, and I work at the middle school, so I don't have a tween quite yet, but I often think, man, kiddos, you need more of that survival instinct. I don't know what you're doing, but you should do less of that, yeah? <laughs> yeah. And the third thing it's responsible for is memory, okay? We as parents, how is our children's memories inside of us, right? I remember what it was like when my little guy took his very first steps. It was in a classroom at the school. I know those things. He does not remember them because his brain is busy freeing up space right now. The other bit that your amygdala is responsible for is called the four Fs. Fight, flight, freeze, or faint. 
okay? Uh, when I teach this in the middle school, I always use fainting goats just because they're funny. Um, but your amygdala is responsible for those basic human, oh, there's a car coming, what do I do? There's a black bear on the path, what happens next? Oh my gosh, something is occurring and I need to move. That is the bit of your brain that's responsible. So I want you to think for a minute about the fact that this neural pruning and the synaptic growth starts there first. How many of you have ever looked at a teen in your life, a teen that you love dearly and you think to yourself, or maybe you've asked them, what were you thinking? Yeah? And how many of those beloved teens or tweens looked at you and said, I don't know. Because they literally don't, you guys. They don't know because the back of their brain is what they're thinking from and not the front because your prefrontal cortex grows last. So let's talk about neural growth, okay? The tween and the teen years uh, represent the biggest growth years for the brain since infancy, okay? Think of all the things that we're learning how to do during this time. Have healthy relationships, navigate school, learn cool hobbies, figuring out how to drive. These are big. I don't know if, about you, but I've tried to pick up hobbies as a grown up and I like fumble my way through them. And I think of the fact that these kids go out and they're like, you know what I'm gonna learn how to do? Play volleyball. And then they just do it, right? Their brains are growing, but I also want you to think about this a different way. This means that you are now the proud parent of a giant toddler, <laughs> right? Uh, I want you to think that if you've ever looked at them and thought, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, there's a lot happening right now. Whew. It's because there is. This is the most that their brains have grown since they were babies. There is a, there's a lot happening in there, okay? So we've talked a little bit about the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. We've talked about why the prefrontal is the last to develop. Um, and I think the next bit that we need to talk about is how our brains physically recover from our days. And I know that Gordon talked a little bit about this with the brainwash, but think back to what, what it was like when you were 15. I want you to think about the classes you took. You're probably in algebra, you probably had a bio, maybe a chem if you were smart. I was not in class at all. You had English. You had practice after school. Your parents had responsibilities for you. You were trying to figure out how to ask that cute person out to prom. There is so much happening. You just, whew, you're learning all of these things. Your brain is constantly processing. What that means inside of your brain though is that your neurochemicals are just flowing. So we're talking serotonin, dopamine, we have adrenaline coursing through all of these things. Sleep is so very important because sleep is when our brains and our bodies physically recover from our day, okay? As grownups, I, I can speak for myself, I won't speak for anybody else, but I know when I've had a really hard day, if I can get a good night's sleep, I feel way better in the morning, right? Tweens and teens are the same, but I want you to remember the fact that every day of their existence, they're learning new things, okay? So I want you to think back. When your kiddo was a toddler or a kiddo that you loved was a toddler, did you ever look at them when they were throwing a hissy fit and thought, oh man, you need a nap, yeah? Or you would do that thing where you would like, look around because maybe there's a meltdown at the grocery store and you're like, oh, somebody needs a nap. Cause you're like, oh my gosh, I just need to get out of here. Just, just me, no one else. Okay. I want you to think about having a tween as having a giant toddler with a weird little mustache and a driver's permit. Okay. It's true. They, they need a nap because their brains are overloaded with information. And when we sleep, our brains physically recover. So when we talk about how much sleep seven to 12 year olds need, they need 10 to 11 hours, okay? That, that, that's a lot of sleep. When we're talking older kids, 12 to 18, they need nine hours and these are minimums. So your mileage may vary. Maybe you have a 17 year old who still needs 10 hours of sleep. That's okay. Their brains and their bodies are working really hard. However, um, maybe it's just the kiddos that I know. 
but I hear this a lot. Oh, no, no, Miss Meyer, like I didn't, I totally didn't get enough sleep last night because I was up cleaning. Okay. I encourage you strongly as parents to take charge of smart devices. It's okay to say, I understand that you wanna text your friends until two in the morning, but you still have to go to algebra two in the morning. So that means I need your device. It's okay to do that. Remember how I said they're giant toddlers? I know that the response to that won't always be very pleasant for you, and I apologize in advance. But they need that sleep. And if you're aiming for pleasant, just like when they were kiddos, like babes, they need sleep. I can't express that enough. I also wanna talk about how brain growth during adolescence heavily relies on social cues, okay? I want you to think about all the fun things that happen when we're in this age. Maybe you found your best friend. Maybe you fell in love for the very first time. Uh, maybe they were changing parental relationships in your life, right? Teachers, other mentors, important coaches, all of those people. Who is around your child? How are they influencing how their brain is literally developing and growing? I know that when Gordon was up here, he said, oh, my football coach said just rub some dirt in it and keep on going. He remembers that. We carry those things inside of us, right? Who are you encouraging your young person to be around? Because that is literally who they're shaping their brains around. Yeah, that's powerful. And I want you to think about the wonderful community that we live in here in Valdez and how many wonderful people are day to day around your student and your child. I know sometimes we get really wrapped up in stuff like attendance policies and pre and post makeup work and jobs and all of those things. Think about who's around your student. Think about how lucky we are to live here, right? And remind your kiddo of that too. Man, you're so lucky that so-and-so is your little dribblers coach. They're a really good person. Also with that, how do you respond when your kiddo is upset? Are you modeling good behavior? And when I say good behavior, I mean good responses. Are you modeling a good way to respond to crisis, to stress, to overwhelming emotion? And by no means by saying that you have to be 100% on all the time. My kiddo is in the audience tonight and he can absolutely tell you that there have been moments that he's had a bad day and I've been like, ah! because we're people too, right? But that's important because those neural growths are going to take that and they say, okay, mom had a bad moment, but hey, she recovered and we're okay now. And his brain takes that in. Lastly, I wanted to talk about mental health concerns that pop up during this time. So our brains are not fully developed until we're roughly 25. Again, your personal mileage may vary on that one. Maybe your brain took a little bit longer, maybe a little bit shorter, but 25 is about the ballpark. During this time, it's really important to monitor your young person or young person that you love for mental health concerns. Just like when your kiddo was a baby and you were frantically Googling in the middle of the night what the symptoms of like poop were, right? We've all done that. How to swaddle, I don't know. I just want him to stop crying. Um, I don't know when my kiddo is supposed to take first steps. All of those things that we Google. I know that Google does not have all the answers, but goodness, it is a good starting point. Educate yourself about what depression, anxiety looks like in young people. Educate yourself about why sleep is important for brain development for your children. Because just like G.I. Joe said in the 80s when I was growing up, or maybe it was reading Rainbow, I don't know. The more we know, the farther we go, right? If you know ahead of time, oh, I know what depression looks like for young women because there's a young woman in my life that I care about. And then you see those signs. I want you to take the stigma away from that and be able to say, hey, I love you and I'm worried. And I did, I did the Googler. And I have some info I want to pass on, okay? All of these things are how we help brains develop. It's how we show that people, um, that we care about them, okay? And the other one that I wanted to leave you with before I get out of here, so go with your hand again for me, just like that. 
So your prefrontal is here, your amygdala is here. Oftentimes during the teen and tween years, we do what's called popping our top, right? Where we are so overstimulated that all we are thinking with is our amygdala, okay? By being calm, by being cool and collected and role modeling how to properly or adequately respond to things, we help bring that tension back down. And we show our students and our kiddos that we love that it's okay to go through crisis and that your brain is gonna help you get there. That is my swan talk. Okay, thank you, Kyra. One more round of applause for Kyra. Dr. Meyer. All right, and now it gives me a great honor to introduce my friend, Dr. Angela Alfaro. All right, awesome. You guys hear me? Fantastic. Okay, so have a look at this picture, and how many animals do you see? Two. All right, so if we change it, what do you see? Now you see another one, right? So we had this one, we had this one. So if we put it together, so what have we changed? We changed just the viewpoint, right? We changed the perspective of what we're looking at. So our talk is gonna talk about perception. And if you were, saw the title slide, I also talk about plants and protein, so how does that come with perception. But perception comes from how we uh, intervene with our environment. How do we use our senses to learn, to assimilate that information, to make choices, to make decisions. And our perceptions can then lead to sometimes false beliefs called myths. And so we want to not do those things. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So plants, proteins, and perceptions is what we're gonna talk about today. So perception number one, that we need more protein. We need protein. How many times have you heard, we need protein, we need protein. Or if you're more of a plant slant diet, vegan, vegetarian diet, where are you getting your protein? Where are you getting your protein? So first of all, what is protein? What does it even do? And it's extremely important for our bodies. And all of these lists of the repair and recycling of our, um, of our cells, it works as hormones, so we do things like, you know, grow, puberty, those sex hormones need protein, our thyroid needs protein, um, the, uh, our immune system is extremely important and then we need protein for this, right? So we need protein to keep our, our blood pH normal, we need protein to help keep the fluid inside our body so that we don't get edematous and have swelling in our legs. It transports things, it builds our structure, our hair, our nails, everything that's going on in our body, we need to have that protein. So it is important. Then we look at growth. We talk a lot about kids today and growing is extremely important and you need protein to grow, to make that scaffolding, you need protein. Um, muscle grows with protein too, we know that. That's an easy one, right? That's why everyone says you need more protein because we're, we're losing muscle, by the way. So after we get to about age 30, then we start to deteriorate our muscles. So we have to actively use our muscles or they will continue to deteriorate at a rate of about four to 5% every decade. Yay. So tumors grow with excess protein also. And so if we get to this ripe old age of 20, like Olivia and myself, we, um, we, we're not growing children anymore. We're not pregnant lactating. Maybe probably we don't have a burn or wound that we're repairing. So what else could be growing in this time frame? We hope that it's not tumors. But unfortunately, there's an epidemic of cancer as we know. And so we have to think about that. Why are 35, 40, 45 year old people getting colon cancer at an increased rate nowadays? Why is that? Certainly it's environment, pesticides, what have you. Could maybe there be something with this protein? Maybe. And then there's waste. What do we do with it? We don't store it. So that big steak you plan on eating Friday night, you're not gonna use it by, uh, you know, save it up and use it on Monday, Tuesday for your workout program. We don't save it. It gets processed. 
Protein does not leak out through our urine unless there's a medical situation. So in the normal cases, we don't have protein in our urine. What we do have is nitrogen. So the protein gets metabolized and then it breaks down and we excrete um, nitrogen through our skin, our stool, and our urine. So that's why it's pretty darn important. Did I skip a slide? No. So here's interesting. You probably have all heard of blue zones, right? Anybody not? So blue zones are the areas in the world that have the highest proportion of people over the age of 100. They're called centenarians. They don't wake up one morning and say, I want to live to 100. They just do. They just do it. And what's interesting about these places, Loma Linda and Costa Rica, Italy, Greece, and Okinawa, is guess what? They have a predominant plant-based diet. Loma Linda is the vegan, where the rest are plant-based. And it's not that they don't ever have meat or um, animal products, but the majority of their diet is from plants. It's about 10% protein. So how are they living to 100, yet only 10% of their calories is coming from protein? It must, must be some weird phenomenon, yet it's happening in these pockets all over the world. So here's what our protein requirements are. And so 0.8 grams to one gram per kilogram per day, that's the RDA. So the recommended daily allowance, we've heard this for nutrients that we need, is 0.8. And that's if you're healthy. So that's if you're a healthy person without a chronic illness, without a burn, without a wound, without an infection, 0.8 is what we should get. And it depends on what resource where you look at. There's lots of different opinions on this as to how much we need. Um, then it could go up. Children need much more, obviously, right? They're growing. So in that teen years as well, big toddlers, they're growing. Then there's athletes, which hopefully all of us in this room are consider ourselves an athlete. So that's the first thing to do. Consider yourself an athlete, and then you are, and then you get out and ride fat bikes on a very windy, chilly day. So athletes need more protein because protein is incorporated into those muscles. If you don't have the protein, then your muscles don't grow but they just don't grow because you ate the protein. Does that make sense? You have to actively break down muscle to build muscle. So sitting on the couch, eating your steak, does not make you an athlete, nor does it make you grow your muscles. There's a new category here, this master athlete. So anyone over the age of 35 who's actively engaged in kind of competitive activities, consider themselves a master athlete, and you're gonna need some more protein too. Um, again, as we get older, then we may not want to eat as many things, our teeth might not be as good, and so it gets harder and harder to have protein. So where is this balance, this yin and yang of protein? Not enough, too much, how much is enough? And this is our basic guidelines that if you are actively engaged in all these activities, then you probably need to have more protein for that. So we're gonna do some math, John's favorite subject. And so we figure out, so we've got the RDA, the recommended daily allowance, the athlete and then the master athlete, and just put up some numbers there that let's say the 70 kilogram woman, um, what is her requirement gonna look like? So 56 grams at the recommended daily allowance, and then 84 grams and 112 grams if she ends up being in that category. And so when you do that, you can figure out, okay, that's about the range of, of the uh, protein that I need in the day. And like we said, you can't just get it at one time. If you just eat one big fat steak and get your protein or your big fat plate of vegetables and get some protein, you need to eat it throughout the daytime because you're gonna process what you need and you're gonna excrete the rest because you're not gonna store it. Then what I'd like to pay attention to is how do we calculate the calories from, uh, from the grams of the protein? Because this is gonna come back to us in just a little bit. So this is basic nutrition science that you probably learned in school that for protein, four calories per gram, carbohydrates, the same, four, and fat has nine calories. So that's why fat causes us to gain weight and that we get more calories. So even um, just the science of it, just the mathematics, nine uh, calories per gram. So for this particular person, if we just looked at our top RDA, 54 grams of protein, and that would equal 224 calories of her day um, are from protein. So if that amount of protein in her diet is 11.2%, that's already above what most of those blue zone folks are getting on a daily basis. So if there's an athlete, a master athlete, or you're just really, really eating lots of protein, you can see how we're gonna tip the scales and be on a higher side of protein. 
Um, similar, I did it for a man, I won't go through the exact same things all, but you can look at it and see that if you're about 85 kilograms, 187 pounds in a man, then can go from you know 68 to 128 grams of protein is around what you need. Now, there are some really amazing athletes that are getting their amount of protein from vegan lifestyles, so it can be done. Um, there's uh, football players, uh, the Oakland Raiders, uh, Venus Williams, there's uh, Tom Brady is mostly, but not all the way vegan. So, you know, everybody is trying, I think, in a little bit of more uh, healthy type of thing. So here's what I was saying. So this 101 grams of protein is kind of the average for the sedentary male. And that's probably too much, especially if he's not doing anything to use that, that protein. Okay, so what do you see here? This is another mind break for just a minute. Um, do anybody see triangles? I see triangles? No, there's no triangles. There are no triangles. There's Pac-Mans and there's lines. And our body wants to fill the space, our brain wants to fill the space and make triangles. Because that's what we do, right? We get a little bit of information here, we get a little bit of information there, we assimilate it and then we make um, suggestion after that. And our perception is that there's triangles. So, trivia for you, there's not. So our perception number two are that plants are not complete proteins. Many of us may have heard this before, that plants can't possibly power us because they just don't have all the proteins that we need. I'm here to say that that's not true. Everything in food is gonna work together. And if you choose this side, maybe it's a little better than that side, uh, but we really have to see that how these things work together. So here's what a protein is made up of, right? amino acids, peptides, and then finally your protein. It doesn't matter where it comes from. If it came from an animal, it came from a plant, it breaks down into these amino acids, which are essential, diet of those, or non-essential. The essential ones mean you must get it from your diet. You can't just uh, make them on your own. So it breaks down to these amino acids, and then those team up together to get a little bit longer. That's peptides. A little bit longer of those, lots more complicated, and lots of other chemical reactions gives us the protein. There is definitely differences in the types of amino acids in vegetables versus animal products. That is not up for debate. There's proportion issues. There's going to be more in some and more in others. You may have heard at some point in time that people say you should combine your, your plants so that you get a complete protein. Well, I'm here to say is that your body is constantly working and constantly changing, making all of these enzymes and cofactors and everything that it does. It doesn't do it only when you're eating. So if you had beans for breakfast or lunch, and then you had your grain at dinner that had some of the other amino acids, your body's gonna figure that out. They've been doing it for hundreds of years, right? This is not a surprise. And so you don't have to sit and say, I have to make sure I get all 20 amino acids every meal. Nobody's going to do that. Meat eaters don't do that. Vegans don't do that. Here's a list that I've come up with that talks about a lot of the different proteins that are in plants. They in my office that I give to my patients to say that, hey, look, you can get lots of protein from whole wheat, lentils, and all the vegetables. So if you start combining those things to know that you have protein, then you're going to get plenty of what you need. Now, you may need to supplement things if you're striving for that 120 grams because you're a master's athlete that's doing triathlons, Sean was there. But you know, it's, it's, uh, it's easy enough to get things from, from your diet. Here's a, a, a nice little table because what it shows us is that we're comparing plants, animal plants and refined plants. We do have to be careful. There's all kinds of food replacements, including frankenfoods that have all kinds of stuff in them. And a recent study did show that that's even more unhealthy than your animal-based diet, which I completely agree with, because it has all kinds of chemicals that we're making. And so when we're talking about this type of diet, the blue zones, it's a whole food plant-based diet. It's not all of the different types of things, even though they are tasty and delicious. But what this also shows us is what comes along with protein. So it may not be exactly protein that causes some of these other problems, too much of it, but it carries with it. Animal pro proteins carry with it cholesterol and fat and no fiber. No fiber in, in animals, but there's lots of fiber in the plants. And so just an interesting um, table there. So I was really excited to see this optical illusion on two of my previous presenters' pages. And so this one, 
you guys have seen it already, so there's no, no joke here. But what's interesting is that when they were doing these things and making them up, they didn't start out to make faces and then a vase that you might be seeing, it just was drawings. Just drawings and pictures, and then again, our mind wants to make sense of things. And so it wants to see that there's either a vase or there's two people looking at each other. So perception number three is plant protein is too expensive and hard to find. I hear that every single day. It's too expensive, it's too hard to find. Well, I can tell you that's not true. I can tell you that the opposite problem is true, is that meat is very expensive and it doesn't go very far. And there's lots of things that you can do that you can get cheaper food and affordable food. So for instance, here was something that I had created as how do we get how do we get a good week's lunch? Okay, maybe it's monotonous, you've got the same food, but my staff will tell you that I do that all the time. Um, and look how cheap it is. So cost per lunch, $3.37 for my lunch. Can you get a lunch at $3.37 anywhere in town? Probably not, right? And so you have, and what else is in there besides the cheap lunch? It's 40 grams of plant fuel protein, 15 grams of fiber. Again, a lot of really nutritious lunch. And so that's what lentils and beans are one of the cheapest things anywhere and easy to get, easy to buy in bulk, easy to get at Costco, order online, they ship those things here. So there's lots of ways that you can get the plants um, in your diet. And you go to the store creatively. We live in Valdez, we know this, right? There are certain days the trucks don't come. Okay, I'm gonna eat what's in the fridge. Then we go on other days. The zucchini looks like, I don't know what. I'm not eating that today. So I'll change my mind. Maybe I'll have cabbage instead. And so there's ways that you can think about what are you gonna get at the store, change your mind, have a few different options in, in mind. Frozen vegetables actually are very good for us and delicious. Flash frozen in most of the cases, they hold on to their nutrients. Canned beans are fine. Sometimes they have some sodium, but cans can be fine too. Uh, one of my mentors who does a lot of work with VA systems, that's how she got her uh, members to eat vegetables, was with canned vegetables. And so, there's ways, we just have to be creative. We can have parties with friends, we can learn to cook. That's a big barrier too, right? Me, I don't know how to cook a plant or they all taste like cardboard and you know, your whole food is weird, I don't want that. So there's lots of ways to get around that. All right, how about this guy? What do you think, straight lines, slanted lines? Straight, slanted? They're actually straight. Interesting, just the way that the, the lines line up. So that is just, again, another illusion, another percept or perception of things. So here's my perception number four. Protein bars are mainly protein. They're delicious, right? They're so good for us. Let's just grab a protein bar on the go. They're just gonna be so amazing. Oh, contrary, contrary. No, 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 no. So here's pictures I took just from the grocery store, just in the, the Safeway with their proteins there. And I just randomly picked one. I don't have any preference. I don't even know what, what company it is and then took a picture of it. So remember that math we talked about of how you're gonna figure out the calories from the protein, the calories from the carbohydrates, the calories from the fat. And so you'll see that there's eight grams of fat here, there's 40 grams of carbohydrates in this one. So really, at 160 calories are coming from carbohydrates, you actually have yourself a carbohydrate bar with a little bit of protein. Guess what else has carbohydrates and some protein? Beans, vegetables, yes, of course. And so when you look back at those blue zone areas, their diet is probably 70, 80% carbohydrates, yet they're still doing awesome. They're not pastry donuts, friends, no, they're plants. And so with that comes all the other phytonutrients and fiber and all of the things that we need, but they have a very high carbohydrate diet. And they're doing awesome. So perception, is super powerful, right? If we perceive things that come in, our friend Dr. Google shows up and there is, you can find an agreement, an argument with whatever side that you're on. So our perception is gonna be extremely important as to how we proceed in our own health and the health of our friends and family. So my takeaway messages are this. We need protein, we need enough. We don't need too much and we don't need too little because it is so important, but it's just like so many things in life we need balance. We need like a bell-shaped curve of protein. Plants are complete proteins, don't be fooled. They have everything that we need in them, except for a couple of nutrients, which could be supplemented. So 
Some on my vacations, again, will say, well, meat has everything, and it doesn't, or it has all that extra baggage. So it can be created craftily uh, as a whole food plant-based diet with some supplementation, if and when necessary. Plant proteins are affordable, so easy to find, even in Bounty. Yes, when you go out of town and you act like you're at Christmas with a buffet of oranges and strawberries, because they're so fresh and juicy and delicious, which is amazing, but you can find things, maybe dried oranges, but you can find some vegetables here at the grocery store. And protein bars are no better than Whole Foods, my friend. In fact, they might be worse because they have all these extra fillers and things that we just don't need. And on that's my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Alfaro. Please give a round of applause to all of our speakers tonight. you being here. This has been a passion project of ours. We really wanted to bring information to the community and our community is so rich with knowledge. This is an event that we would like to carry on. So if you are interested in being a presenter for a future event, please let us know. If you would like to ask any of us any questions, at the end we'll be hanging out here on the stage. And if you have a chance, we'd love some feedback. So Growth mindset, I figured out a QR code. <laughs> Go ahead and scan that into your phone. Do our quick less than a minute survey and we'd really appreciate it. Thank you everyone, have a great night.